Yosemite, the grand jewel of the national park system. The first, and for many, the greatest of the parks. The modern park encompasses nearly 1,200 square miles of the Sierra Nevada mountains with over 95% designated wilderness. Yosemite hosts over 4 million visitors per year from the U.S. and countries around the world, with most visiting only Yosemite Valley. While Yosemite was not the first U.S. national park, it was the first federally designated grant to create and protect park lands for public use. But the modern Yosemite had a violent start, based on conflict rather than conservation. In reality, the discovery of Yosemite spanned thousands of years and resulted in European Americans finding what the Native Americans already knew. So let's peel back the years and discover Yosemite. It is estimated that the first humans visited the Yosemite region as long as 10,000 years ago. At the time of the discovery of Yosemite Valley by European Americans, the indigenous Awanachi peoples of the Paiute tribe lived in the area. The Awanachi people referred to the area as Awani, or the Big Mouth. However, the nearby Miwok tribe considered the Awanachi to be violent and referred to them as the Yohemiti, meaning they are killers or those who kill. Native legends tell that for the earliest Awanachi, the valley became cursed and the remnants of the tribe fled to the wild tribes across the mountains. For many years the valley was deserted, but eventually a noble youth of the tribe married a maiden of the Mono tribe. They had a son and named him Tanaya. Tanaya remembered the old legends and with others from the old Awanachi returned to the valley of their ancestors. There they prospered and grew powerful. After a fight with a large grizzly bear, the wounded but victorious Tanaya was renamed Ihumati or Grizzly Bear. This word and its pronunciation was later confused by the European Americans for the word Yosemite. Regardless of the legends, a Chief Tanaya was ruling over a tribe of Native Americans living in the Yosemite Valley when European Americans arrived in the Sierra Nevada mountains. The tribe was referenced both as the Iwanachi and the Yosemite tribe. In the fall of 1833, trappers, led by mountain man Joseph Redford Walker, may have been the first European Americans to view Yosemite Valley from the cliffs above. Zenas Leonard, a trapper in the Walker Party, wrote in his journal a description of a high waterfall that could have been that of Yosemite Falls. However, there is no proof that the party looked upon Yosemite Valley, and modern historians strongly doubt that they did. In 1848, gold was discovered at Sutter's Mill near present-day Sacramento, California. Lumber mill operator William Abrams, like thousands of others, departed for California. In October 1849, Abrams and his traveling companion U.N. Reamer while searching for possible lumber mill sites, recorded in his diary the likely sighting of Yosemite Valley. Abrams wrote of getting lost while hunting a grizzly bear. Found our way to camp over an Indian trail that led past a valley enclosed by stupendous cliffs, rising perhaps 3,000 feet from their base. Not far off a waterfall dropped from a cliff below three jagged peaks into the valley. While further beyond a rounded mountain stood, 
the valley side of which looked as though it had been sliced with a knife, as one would slice a loaf of bread, and which Reber and I called the Rock of Ages. Abrams appears to be describing El Capitan, Bridal Veil Falls, Cathedral Rocks, and Half Dome, probably from the location later known as Inspiration Point. If accurate, Abrams and Reamer could be credited with being the first non-Native Americans to view Yosemite Valley. However, there is no proof that Abrams entered the valley. The gold rush, the migration of European Americans, and others from around the world dramatically increased the population of California in a very short time. As the gold miners spread out from the original gold strikes to other regions of the Sierra Nevada mountains, they began to encroach upon the lands and livelihoods of the Native Americans. The gold miners competed for and depleted the resources of the region upon which the Native Americans depended. In addition, the Native Americans were often murdered, enslaved, or struck with the devastating diseases brought by the outsiders. As such, the Native Americans began to defend their lands and attack the newcomers. The scarce historical documents of the period, most written some years later from the European-American perspective of Dr. Lafayette Bunnell, in his book, Discovery of the Yosemite and the Indian War of 1851, which led to that event, record the growing conflict that led to the discovery of Yosemite Valley. Bunnell himself arrived in California sometime in 1849 to try his luck in the search for gold. He then records that during the winter of 1849-50, he ascended the old Bear Valley Trail from Ridley's Ferry on the Merced River and got a glimpse of some of the high features of Yosemite Valley. While intrigued, Bunnell continued his search for gold. Bunnell records that a James D. Savage, of which there are no known images and represented here in a generic picture, was a prosperous miner who ran a trading post located about 15 miles below the Yosemite Valley along the south fork of the Merced River. Bunnell wrote that for the most part, Savage got along reasonably well with the Native Americans. Savage even employed Native Americans as miners as well as married as many as five Native American women weaving a tapestry of family ties in order to keep the peace. Nevertheless, discontent was brewing, as Bunnell wrote of Savage. One of his five squaws assured him that a combination was maturing among the mountain Indians to kill or drive all the white men from the country and plunder them of their property. Savage alerted the other settlements of the potential threat. Savage then traveled to San Francisco, accompanied by two of his Native American wives as well as a local chief. Savage hoped to impress upon them the superiority of the European Americans in the region and deter them from attacking. It appears that Savage was well aware that the final violent outcome would only destroy the Native American tribes of the region. Upon his return to the trading post, Savage, who spoke the Native American languages reasonably well, tried to convince the Native Americans that peace was a better path. Bunnell recorded Savage's plea, narrated to him by Savage himself. I know that some of the Indians do not wish to be friends with the white men. It is better for the Indians and white men to be friends. If the Indians make war on the white men, every tribe will be exterminated not one will be left. If war is made and the Americans are aroused to anger, every Indian engaged in the war will be killed before the whites will be satisfied. Savage then brought forth the local chief that accompanied him on his trip to San Francisco to confirm his plea. The chief confirmed that the European Americans in the cities were numerous but then went on to say, Those white tribes will not come to the mountains. They will not help the gold diggers if the Indians make war against them. The local chief then implored the Native Americans to unite and attack immediately before any more gold diggers arrive. Savage was surprised at the chief's speech and discouraged by its results on those attending. 
Savage continued to plead for peace, but other chiefs joined in the chorus to attack. In December of 1850 and January of 1851, Savage's trading post and other settler locations were raided, ostensibly by Awanachis and possibly by warriors from such tribes as the Chowchilla, Chukchansi, and Kuwia. Savage and others joined together to form local groups of militia to respond to the attacks, but with only limited success. However, in 1851, the new state of California, only a few months old by then, mustered a number of volunteer battalions to deal with the growing Native American violence. Bunnell recorded that the Mariposa County Battalion came into service on January 24, 1851 with the volunteers providing their own horses and equipment. The state generously provided camp supplies and baggage trains. A Major Ben McCulloch, already well known for his service as a Texas Ranger and in the war with Mexico, was offered the command of the battalion, but refused as it did not pay well enough. Savage then took command of the battalion. Bunnell himself was assigned to the battalion as a company medical doctor. Savage led the battalion in pursuit of about 200 Awanachis led by Chief Tanaya himself. Toward the latter part of March, a battalion company reached a viewpoint from where the main features of Yosemite Valley could be seen. There is some argument as to the actual date that the Mariposa Battalion first entered Yosemite Valley. Bunnell, who was there, cites it as about March 21, 1851, with other sources dating it as March 27. Author James Mason Hutchings, a well-known writer of Sierra Mountain history and lore, citing Elliott's history of Fresno County, puts the date as May 5th or 6th. Hutchings cites the dispatches of Major Savage, as recorded in Elliott's history, as proof of the May dates. However, Bunnell wrote that the adjutant attached to Major Savage was not present at the March entry into the valley, and that the adjutant likely used his own first entry into the valley as the discovery date. Considering it is recorded that Bunnell's company reached a viewpoint of Yosemite Valley toward the latter part of March, it seems likely that Bunnell's late March date is accurate as it should not have taken over a month to then descend into the valley. Upon arrival into the valley, Bunnell records his astonishment of the scene. None but those who have visited this most wonderful valley can even imagine the feelings with which I looked upon the view that was there presented. Bunnell later guided his horse off the trail and became separated from the main company. Not long afterward, Major Savage, Bringing up the rear of the column and concerned about a surprise Indian attack, noted that Bunnell was missing and called out. You had better wake up from the dream up there or you may lose your hair. Bunnell replied, If my hair is now required, I can depart in peace, for I have here seen the power and glory of a supreme being. That evening, around the campfire, Bunnell suggested that they confer names upon the valley and the unique features within it. Bunnell recommended names of an American origin rather than foreign and thought that Native American names would be appropriate. Bunnell suggested Yosemite. Then recognizing the probable outcome of their military operation, he continued, The name of the tribe of Indians, which we met leaving their homes in this valley, perhaps never to return, would be perpetuated. Several of the soldiers objected, remarking that the murderous Indians should not be honored as such. However, Bunnell pointed out to those soldiers that honoring the Indians this way would be good objects on which to develop your Christianity. The name was adopted by the soldiers and remains to this day. Bunnell then went on to name many of the other features of the valley. Chief Tanaya's band was eventually captured and their village burned. The Iwanachi were then relocated to the Fresno River Reservation. 
However, the Iwanichi were miserable on the reservation and wished to return to their home. The reservation officials finally allowed them to return to Yosemite Valley on their own recognizance. In May of 1852, the Iwanichi were accused of attacking eight miners and killing two. As a result, the Iwanichi fled the valley to the nearby Mono tribe. A year later, the Iwanichi returned to the valley, but in a dispute with the Mono tribe, the Monos attacked the Iwanichi and killed nearly all of Tanaya's warriors and captured the women and children. Tanaya himself was stoned to death, the final blow delivered by the young Mono chief, Captain John Paiute. 1855 saw the arrival of James Mason Hutchings and artist Thomas Ayers, along with others, on a tourist group led by Hutchings. Ayers completed the first original renderings of Yosemite Valley. The world received its first view of Yosemite as a single lithograph poster of Ayers' Yosemite Falls, published by Hutchings in 1855. Other Ayers images and their story were then published as the first article in Hutchings' Illustrated California Magazine, Volume 1, Number 1, dated July of 1856. Ayers went on to display his images in art exhibitions and later returned to Yosemite and made additional sketches. Sadly, Ayers and a large collection of his California landscape art perished about April 26, 1858, when the passenger schooner Laura Bevan, on which Ayers was sailing, sank in the waters off Southern California, although some reports placed the sinking off San Francisco. It needed but a glance at his paintings to show that California has lost an artist whose genius would, ere long, have copiously illustrated her mountain scenery. The Daily Alta, California, May 27, 1858. In 1856, Galen Clark, while seeking rest and fresh air for his tuberculosis infection, became the first European American to view the Mariposa Grove of giant sequoia trees. Clark would spend much of his life exploring the region, writing and teaching about the giant trees, and running a small hotel for visitors. Clark's writings and teachings were instrumental in securing the federal grant to preserve Yosemite and the Mariposa Grove. In 1859, Hutchings took photographer Charles Leander Weed to Yosemite Valley, where Weed took the first known photographs of the valley. In September of 1859, Weed displayed his photographs to the public at a San Francisco exhibit. Hutchings would later use the Weed photos as the basis for woodcut images he published in his own works. Hutchings also worked with photographer Carlton Watkins, who did commissions for Hutchings' Illustrated California magazine. Watkins arrived in Yosemite in 1861, where he made large plate photographs as well as stereo view images. Watkins' images were some of the first seen on the east coast of the United States. Sadly, Watkins lost his gallery and images to creditors, and later his health and sight. He passed away at the Napa State Hospital in 1916 and was buried in an unmarked grave at the hospital. Watkins' photos were immensely influential in securing the federal grant to preserve Yosemite and the Mariposa Grove. New publicity brought more tourists and soon lodgings were constructed, including Galen Clark's small hotel and the Hutchings House Lodge. Hutchings House later expanded to include the Big Tree Room, which was built around a living tree. However, by the early 1860s, it was already evident that tourism and settlement was having a negative impact on the valley and the big trees. Unitarian minister Thomas Starr King argued in his oratories and in his writings in the Boston Evening Transcript of those negative impacts and called for a public park at Yosemite. Starr King's words influenced the likes of Oliver Wendell Holmes and landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted famed co-designer of New York's Central Park. With these moving words and Carlton Watkins' photographs revealing the stunning beauty of Yosemite, 
the U.S. Congress and President Abraham Lincoln were moved to protect the valley and the big trees. As the U.S. Civil War raged on, the Yosemite Grant was signed into law on June 30, 1864 by President Lincoln. Soon after, Yosemite Valley and the Mariposa Grove of Big Trees was ceded to California as a state park. Frederick Law Olmsted led a board of commissioners to govern the grant and appointed Galen Clark as the first guardian of the park. Famed naturalist and conservationist John Muir arrived in Yosemite Valley in 1868 and took work with a local rancher as a shepherd. Muir studied the region and wrote many articles about Yosemite and conservation. Over the years, Muir invited many influential people to camp with him, including Ralph Waldo Emerson and President Theodore Roosevelt. Muir was convinced that the region must be under federal protection and, with his influence, on October 1, 1890, a large region around the valley and the big trees was declared a national park. However, although the valley and the big trees were enclosed in the new national park, they remain separate as a California state park. Muir continued to lobby for the inclusion of the valley and the big trees in the new national park. While Muir worked to create a whole Yosemite National Park, steady improvements were made to better accommodate the growing stream of visitors. By 1869, rail service reached Stockton, California, and by 1872 it reached Merced, a key gateway to Yosemite Valley. By 1875, three stagecoach routes were completed to ferry passengers into Yosemite. In 1876, the famed Wawona Hotel was built to handle even more tourists. Within a few years, stagecoach routes also reached Glacier Point and Tuolumne Meadows. The first automobiles arrived in Yosemite Valley in 1900 and rail service reached El Portal in 1907. President Roosevelt visited Yosemite in May of 1903 and camped with Muir near Glacier Point. As progress continued, Muir convinced Roosevelt that Yosemite should be a unified park and on June 11, 1906, Roosevelt signed legislation unifying the National Park, the Valley, and the Big Trees. However, subsequent legislation reduced the overall size of the park to two-thirds of its original size, where it remains today. Today, Yosemite regularly ranks within the top five most visited national parks hosting over 4 million people per year. Yosemite offers a wide range of activities. Visitors can leisurely stroll the valley or take extended trips into the wilderness. World-class rock climbing challenges even the most experienced climbers, while water lovers can kayak, canoe, and whitewater raft. Winter sports include downhill sliding California's oldest slopes and cross-country advocates can ski quiet wilderness trails. More relaxed endeavors include wildlife viewing, fishing, horseback riding, art, and photography. And every turn of the head offers yet another spectacular view.